immediate problem, 2030, flooding, 2050, sea level rise, 2070. At least that's what we hope. What we're finding is these targets are moving and they're getting closer and closer, okay? We have a range of other things that come along with them, which include reduced open space, losses in our tree canopy, water quality issues, and some environmental contamination. Okay. First issue is heat, and this is actually the most immediate issue because by 2030, Cambridge is going to be significantly hotter than it is today. In fact, we're going to have three times the number of days over 90 uh, by 2030, um, and six times that number by 2070. And heat's actually the biggest weather-related uh, killer of Americans right now, much more than flooding or any other hazard. Okay, so we're going to triple the number of extremely hot days, and that leads to respiratory distress, heat stroke, and a number of other issues. And we have an aging population that is relatively vulnerable. This is what the heat map looks like for 2030. Orange seems like it would be slightly problematic. In fact, orange means extreme caution. And you can see there's a couple of areas marked in darker red, and those are marked as danger. Okay. So one of, the things about, one of the things about heat is it's a much more universal problem across the entire city. Yeah. Heat doesn't discriminate. It goes wherever it wants to go. Okay? That's how thermodynamics work. This is Cambridge in 2070. Okay. As I mentioned, red is a, a danger, and you'll see there's actually a, a smaller area of extra red, which is called extreme danger. That represents temperatures above 124 degrees. Okay. That's the heat index. So that's not necessarily the temperature, that's what it feels like to you. Okay. And one of the things to note about those areas, you see those pockets of extreme red, you can see them, my mic keeps going. Yeah. Um, and they tend to be clustered around areas that are lacking in things like trees and also have a, a large amount of things like pavement, okay? That makes sense because what you'll find if you do the math is that green surfaces are cooler than gray or black surfaces, okay? So on, the, on this chart you see uh, the temperature of a roof or a wall or, or a road as it heats up over time. And if that surface is green, the dotted green line doesn't go up at the same rate the black line goes up. The black line keeps rising. That's the temperature of concrete or your black asphalt roof. The green is the temperature of your green roof or your lawn. And actually, because of evapotranspiration, it doesn't get hotter beyond a certain point. And the other side of that is that at night, it cools down not only faster, but it starts from a lower level. And so it actually returns to a lower base temp temperature, okay? The problem with those higher temperatures there is it makes your air conditioning work uh, more and uh, that actually has its own associated local heat effects and um, it's sort of a negative feedback loop that you're going through. But you can see by moving from gray or black surfaces to green surfaces, that curve goes down. And that's what we want to do. Okay. We have another problem, which is water. So there's going to be more storms in the future. This picture is what a 100-year storm looks like in 2070. That's an aerial view of the quad and the triangle. And you can see some major points of interest. What's the water triangle? Ah. Uh, my neighborhood, all of West Cambridge. And you can see, depending on where you are exactly, the depth can be quite uh, significant. Um, this causes a lot of problems. Right, and the T station, which is right at the bottom, um, is actually the lowest point. Um, and we'll talk about that a little bit later. Here's that map, and you can see a large amount of blue. Blue's bad in this map, okay? Blue means water, makes sense. And though the, the projections here only go up to more than three feet, I can tell you that some of the areas of that blue are more than eight or nine feet, okay? That's 2070 for a 100-year rainstorm. So that's the current definition of, of the floodplain, 100-year storm. So this is what that 100-year storm looks like projected 50 years in the future. And you can see that that water's kind of bubbling up all over town. And that's because when it rains enough, there's only so far that you can push it.
And so you get puddles kind of all over town, except those puddles are very large. We have a third problem, storm surge, and that the sea is actually rising. And those current projections are for one foot of rise by 2030, three feet by 2070, and five feet by the end of the century. Okay? The picture is the Mystic River Dam that protects most of our floodplain. Uh, and that picture was taken in January, and you can see that the water level is about two feet below the top of the dam. Okay. Here's some of the city's elevations, and going back to, going back to the uh, LYT station, this is a picture right out in front of the LYT station, and it shows you that the street out front is at about 18 feet. And you'll see CCB, that's Cambridge City Base. That's an arbitrary number that defines flood elevations, different from Boston City Base, or Brookline City Base, or any other city base. All you need to know is that the numbers are relative. And so what we try to do is give you a little bit of understanding of what that relates to. And one thing you can relate that to is what's the top of that dam at? Okay. The top of that dam is at around 22 feet. Okay. So what that means is we're below the level of that dam, obviously. That dam exists to dry out all of our neighborhood. And that means that when it rains, you have to eject the water back over that dam into the harbor. Okay. That mechanism only works as long as that water is lower on the other side of that dam. In January, we got close to the top, okay? And in fact, um, the water will go around that dam at some point before it reaches the absolute top of that dam. The electrical substation that we all know and love is actually somewhere in between those elevations. And so uh, we have a bit of an issue in terms of the base elevation. For reference purposes, the base elevation of City Hall, directly across the street from us, the front door is 47 feet and the back door is 33 feet. Okay, so we're talking about elevations that are 15 to 20 feet lower than City Hall. So, um, just the electric substation for people who aren't on the western side of town. Uh, there's a substation near the T, near the tracks, um, that services the western part of the city, and that's that would be. In the, that's in the front right. It's not only services all of West Cambridge, it also is the power supply for Belmont. Um, so though Belmont sends us their water, they get their power from us too. Here's what that looks like on the ground when that water rises. So again, this is the sea level projections for 2070 um, when you have a storm surge. Um, the petition covers all the areas that are colored with the exception of the pink area. Okay. Um, Obviously, the purple areas look more extreme than the others, um, but for reference purposes, the purple areas flood every five years, and the other areas flood uh, less, but also significantly. One of the problems that you have with sea level rise is, um, unlike the rain uh, flooding, you'll see that there's a larger component along the river, because by 2070, as the sea level gets high enough, theoretically, you have water bleeding out of the river into Riverside and Cambridge Port. Okay. By 2010, 2100, more than half of Cambridge will flood every 10 years under the current scenarios. Okay. That's basically three times that your home will flood over the course of a 30 year mortgage. Okay. The same uh, UMass study that, um, that many of you may have read recently projected that by 2100, such a storm as that uh, would do $3.3 billion of damage in Cambridge alone in one single storm. And that that would affect roughly 44,000 Cambridge residents, including a predominantly heavy number of vulnerable residents, children, old people, minorities, immigrants, et cetera. Um, I just want to add that um, at 2070, that's when things start taking off. It's kind of gradual to that. It's also when the projections in some cases go sideways because it's far enough out that it's hard to know exactly how bad it will go. But one of the things we're not finding is that people are scaling back their estimates. They tend to be moving targets, but they're only moving in one direction. Okay. You may have seen some of these pictures before. These are from city <coughs> literature talking about flooding. And even today, we're still doing projects. Uh, there's a new project. Um, that is in the port, I believe, that will deal with flood water. And that's a, at least a $35 million project. We have localized flooding today, 
but that will get worse. Okay. One last problem, actually two. One is around tree canopy. This is the city's map of our tree canopy, and many of you may know that we lost 7% of our tree canopy between 29 and 2014. Okay. Um, this is the map of the trees, and the white areas mean no trees. And you'll notice that those white areas match up very closely with those flooded areas and with those hot areas. Okay. Trees and other green landscaping elements are essential if you want to deal with urban heat and with flooding. The other problem that you have uh, as a side effect of all that uh, impervious area that we have across Cambridge is we also have some water quality issues. So in the case of the Elwife Brook and the Little River, they are uh, only meeting water quality standards about half the time, whereas something like Chelsea Creek, which sees a lot of ship traffic, actually meets the numbers about 98% of the time. Okay. When you run water across all that parking lot, you get poor water quality. And you can expect that when you build like this. Okay? It doesn't leave a lot of room in between those buildings for things like trees and grass and green infrastructure. So the question is, why now? And there's three answers. One is that we have the data that says we should act. Okay? We've done the studies, many of them, and we've put together the plan, or at least the draft of the plan. Okay? And there's another problem, which is by 2030, when all of these things start happening, in the case of the floodplain, the bulk of the development's already going to be done. Okay? The Envision Cambridge Master Plan says that you're looking at six million square feet of development at Alewife before 2030. Okay, and 60% of that's going to be commercial, not housing. Okay. Third answer is because if you wait until 2070 to fix the problem, it will be more hard, more difficult to fix the problem. Okay, tomorrow's buildings are getting built right now. Okay, we need to act now if we want to be ready. And. If you look at the FEMA maps, just since the time they were updated, we've built almost 2 million square feet in the 100-year floodplain, and we have permits for over a million more. Okay. In fact, if you add them up, it's over 3,000 units that we've built or permitted since 2010. Okay. That's 4.8 million square feet of development. The Cambridge Hill, or the Cambridge Hill, or the Concord Hill plan proposed 2,192 units. So 70% less by 2024. Okay. We're well ahead of our schedule. Unfortunately, 95% of those units have been built in the 100 or the 500 year flip. So why not wait? Well, you could say we have been waiting. Going back to 2000, when we first start talking about <coughs> adding new bylaws uh, that the Conservation Commission could enforce, but that process was not completed. In 2005, we did a planning study, and even though we knew that there was ongoing a flood study, uh, the zoning actually encouraged more development rather than uh, scaled it back or modified what we got. Okay. In 2010, we issued new maps, and we updated the zoning to reflect that, but we didn't do anything differently if you fell within those flooded areas. We released a couple of reports, and we're still waiting. This is a picture from 19, from uh, uh, that was taken. You can see Ridge Towers in the background, and you can see the man holding up a stick that shows the level of the floodplain. This is roughly where Discovery Park is today. That's from 1982. So this is not a new problem. We've known about this, at least in this neighborhood, for a while. Is it really that bad? Yep, it is. <laughs> so here's what we know. Floodplain's growing. The water's getting deeper. Extreme heat is coming quicker. New buildings are gonna last for a long time. Trees take a long time to become useful. And the more non-green development you do, the harder it is to thwart your future resilient uh, issue. And we need to be proactive and act now. So there's three things that you can do at a, at a global level. Um, if you're not gonna reduce your greenhouse gas, well then you can defend, which means add longer walls, taller dams, bigger pumps, you can retreat, and this is what's been done in New Jersey and Houston and New Orleans, where you stop building in these areas and you buy out the people that are left behind. Or you can do the third one, which is accommodate the water. Prepare for it and learn to live with the changes. And that's both for the heat and the flood. Okay. 
Cambridge is doing that. Fortunately, the city already knows this. They have a plan that is a draft, and it lays out four strategies. So those are prepared community, adapted buildings, you should have more resilient infrastructure, and you should have more resilient ecosystems, okay? And our petition is designed to focus really on two of those because two of those are, have zoning solutions. That's the buildings and the ecosystems, okay? Here's some of the strategies that the CCPR lays out for buildings. Uh, you need to flood and heat protect both new and existing buildings, okay? Um, you need to add more site green infrastructure is their term, and you need to update your zoning. So here's what we propose. First, we need to use our future estimates in planning for the city. So we need to design for the future conditions, not for the conditions in 2010 or before that. Okay? In the future, the floodplain is going to be bigger, so we need to account for that. Okay? We need to encourage more natural systems uh, over engineered solutions. So that's the difference between green systems and gray systems, pipes and tanks. Okay. Uh, engineers are pretty good at finding specific solutions to specific problems, but nature's been testing some of these resiliency strategies for about four billion years, and they seem to have it figured out. So one of the things you can do is look to them for clues. Okay. Amen, yeah. Uh, natural systems, unfortunately, need a little bit of room to work, okay? They can't necessarily work in the small little gaps between large buildings. They need a little more room on the ground, okay? So one of the things we want to do is increase the amount of land that we devote to those uses. That also gives you room for absorbing water, for planting trees, for reducing heat. Okay? And the last thing is we need to ensure that all buildings, no matter who lives in them, are healthy and safe for as far as we can see. So the buildings themselves need to be more resilient. So we wrote a set of zoning amendments, and they're quite long. Um, and the purpose is to protect the health and safety of residents. That's both occupants, neighbors, and even workers who don't live here. And businesses in Cambridge from the serious threats of increased flooding and heat identified in the city studies. And the studies that conclude that the impact of climate change will be severe and it will be widespread. And so we say you should do three things. First, you should expand what you call the floodplain district to protect against those future threats. Okay? And so we're recommending you expand to the numbers that were identified within the vulnerability assessment, which is 2070, 100 year precipitation, <coughs> and, and 2070, 500 year storm surge. Okay. The federal government actually already sort of does this because they don't invest money in new buildings unless they're flood protected. Okay. So they already say that you should be looking to the future for your standards, not to the past. And Envision does that as well. They say that you should build to the 100% sea level rise in the quad, and they say that you should be resilient outside of the quad. That means that your building can get wet and it'll dry out. We would prefer that your building not get wet. What is quad? Uh, an area of Cambridge that is pr the future of uh, West Cambridge development. It tends to have a lot of parking, not a lot of trees, um, and a lot of available land. Between the LRT station and Push Road. I didn't north, think you meant Radford. Right, the, the area north of Freshmont. Second piece is you need to add more requirements for health and safety within that larger area. Okay? So we're going to require that you issue a report if you're developing a piece of land that says that you're um, adhering, that you understand and you're following all of the city planning documents. Okay? Not just the parts that look good. We also are gonna require more early testing uh, for soil and groundwater hydrological testing. This is not necessarily an added cost. This is really just front-loading a cost that developers typically pay when they start to shovel out the dirt and haul it off site. And as soon as you try to send it somewhere, they wanna know what you have and it gets tested. So we would prefer to know earlier so that we can, we can handle it appropriately. From a planning standpoint rather than the reactions. Right. Rather than there's an emergency and we need to deal with it. Okay. Obviously, we want to allow uh, proper emergency access to buildings in the event of flooding. Okay. And we also want to specify the height at which buildings should be erected okay. so that they're resilient. These are already being done by this city. Right. 
one of the differences is they're now being requested in some cases. They're not necessarily written down. We think that you should add hazardous materials uh, rules if those things are not located in areas prone to flooding. You saw a lot of that problem in Houston. Um, and also, if you have critical facilities that you're looking to build for the future, you should think about where they're located and how they're constructed. Um, you probably don't want to locate a new jail, for example, in an area that is due to flood. Similarly, if you know anything about what happened in New Orleans, you'll know that the bulk of the deaths were old people. Okay? They were left behind. So you need to think about what you locate in some of these sensitive areas. Okay? We also want to set some minimum numbers. You got to have at least 30% open space, 30% permeable, and 30% tree canopy. And that can all be the same space. They can overlap. Okay? And the other thing we want to do is add a little bit more setback around the building so you have room for larger mature trees. question. I'll get to that in a minute. Um, we're also going to allow additional building height. If you say I can't fit my um, uh, allowed square footage into the space you gave me because you took away some open space, we'll let you add a little bit of height or at least you can get a special permit to do that. And the same is we'll let you reduce the amount of parking. We think that parking uh, doesn't need to be cheap and readily available when housing is expensive and hard to come by. The other thing is, like everything that happens in the floodplain, currently one to three family homes are exempt. Third piece is you need to add uh, some way of assessing how green is the ground, okay? How green is what you're building. And so we look to other cities and there is a concept called green factor, which is a scoring system that you can apply across the city and it is good for both heat and for water. What it says is for all large projects across the city, you have to calculate what your green factor score is, and I'll tell you what that is in a minute, okay? And if you're in the floodplain, in the more sensitive area, you actually have to meet a minimum number. It's 0.35, just keep that in your head, okay? All right, so what the heck is green factor, okay? It's basically a scoring system that's designed to promote green systems by um, giving weighted scores for different elements. So green spaces obviously are good for cooling, shading people, uh, absorbing rain, filtering pollutants, increasing habitat. There's a lot of things you get from green space. Okay. Developers here can choose from a menu. So like with the LEED standard, they can pick and choose what elements they want to apply as long as they meet the score. Okay. And different elements have different scores. Bigger trees give you more points. Okay. Uh, deeper soil gives you more points. It's based on the value of and it's based on the square footage that it applies to. And then that's compared to the overall size of your lot. Okay, it's a ratio. Okay. It was started in Europe, as everything cool was. Um, it was adopted by Seattle, which is also very cool. Um, and they later expanded it because it's been very successful. Okay. It's used by Washington, D.C. Somerville is in the process of implementing it. Okay. And uh, as we said, we're going to require a minimum score. In the future, the hope is that citywide we can have a score, but right now we want to get the research. So like net zero, we want to find out what people are doing, and then we'll see what we should apply. Okay. Here's a little picture. This is a mid-rise residential building uh, surrounded with a little bit of green, has a little bit of green on the top, has a little bit of green on the sides. This works out to 0.62. Okay. You basically measure out each of those elements, you compare them to a factor of how valuable they are, you add it all up and you compare that to the size of the overall lot and you get a number. Okay? If you already have a large development that you're working on and you already have a landscape architect, as you do, it's trivial for them to plug that into this spreadsheet. Okay? It's one page, they type in the values, and it gives you the score. Okay? And the map on the left shows you what Seattle does. They have various zones where they require different levels. Okay? This on the right, that's the entirety. Right, so that's the whole exercise right there. Not just page one, it is right. page one. If you want to know what their values are, well. Um, when did you get that from Seattle? Yep, yep. So in commercial areas, they use a minimum score of 0.3. If you notice, in residential areas, they use values of 0.5 or 0.6 because green is good for people too, okay? And so we chose a relatively conservative number, 0.35, and maybe over time, the city might consider raising that number. 
But under those standards, here's an example of a building. So this is Amazon's new urban campus, downtown Seattle, and this meets the NIM, the standards, okay? This is a commercial building that meets 0.3, uh, which is what's required there, okay? Has proper green elements. Here's what it looks like on the ground. Kind of looks like the foundry, actually, a little bit, okay? Does it cost? What's the cost of this, okay? Well, despite 10 years in Seattle, nobody's ever done a study, okay? Sorry, don't have that info. We figure that's probably because the costs don't add up to a lot, okay? But this is really just what you should be doing, okay? And the costs really don't add a lot to a project, okay? But if you wanna look at some other predecessor, low impact development is a standard for green, um, and studies of that have found about a 1% upfront cost increase, okay? The guy that wrote the Seattle standards says it's lower. He says it's 0.4%. That seems kind of precise, so I'm gonna go with him, okay? <laughs> the floodplain changes are already being done. They're either a small change, or in some cases, we're removing a restriction. So we don't see this as a huge cost issue. We'll talk more about cost in a minute, though. Like other building safety requirements, fire codes, building codes, you've heard of some of these things, they have a cost, okay? <laughs> They also have a benefit, and we would propose that the benefit exceeds the cost. And if it were a, um, a big issue for the developers, you can be sure that they would be um, making a statement and, and we would hear about it. Right. What's your 0.4% buy you? Well, it gets you a lot of things. Uh, it gets you um, better control of runoff from your property. It allows you to reduce what you spend on um, expensive sewer projects because you don't have as much water running off. Uh, it reduces heat, which also has reduced medical costs to go with it. Um, you're using less energy because your air conditioner doesn't run as hard. Okay. Um, you have less damage to your property from uncontrolled water. Um, you have more room for trees, and trees have a whole host of other benefits. Um, and it creates community space, to be honest, okay? Open space on the ground is where people come together. It's the space in between buildings. And uh, if it's more pleasant, you'll have a more resilient community because people will know their neighbors, okay? So the question is, is this a moderate ask? Well, here's five projects that were permitted recently. Um, three of them are under construction. Two are ready to go, okay? All built within either the 100 or the 500 year floodplain, okay? And what you'll find is that as far as open space requirements go, most of them are already meeting the number, okay? They average about 36% open space, and four out of five actually provided enough. The one that didn't is a commercial project, okay? One of the things you'll also find, though, is even though they have a fair amount of open space, they don't have a fair amount of permeable area, okay? They have parking lots and sidewalks and a lot of things like that, okay? And so, in many cases, the planning board gives them an exception for that permeable area allowance, that requirement. And the reason they give that exception is because they promise to put a bigger tank in the ground, okay? That technique doesn't work if when you put that tank in the ground, you displace groundwater, okay? It's a zero, it's, it doesn't work when that tank is full. Once it's full, there's nowhere else for that to go. So you need a different strategy, okay? The other thing to know is that citywide, if you counted up all the pervious area, we're already at about 33%. And if you counted up all the trees, we're at about 30%. So citywide, we're already meeting the number, okay? The question is, are the new projects gonna do their share? Okay, where do we get all these crazy ideas? Well, half of them came from the city, okay? From the reports and the studies that we do, from the planning that we're engaged in currently. And we also got some from national best practices. So there's a lot of information out there. FEMA, the EPA, the Army Corps of Engineers, they know something about flooding. The American Society of Civil Engineers, they know how to build buildings. And the Urban Land Institute. There's more, I couldn't fit them, okay? But the idea was we went out and we said, what's the industry best practice for new development? And let's do that. Will this restrict development, big question. Well, we made sure that we didn't interfere with the envisioned process, okay? 
That is the proper place to talk about the density of this city, the height of this city, uh, the land uses in this city. That is not what we're commenting on, okay? That's a bigger discussion. We don't affect land use, density, uh, FAR, or location of development. Okay? And we give height allowances so that if you want to raise your home up to get out of the water, you can do that without needing a variance because we'll start counting the height of your house from where the water is, not from the ground. Okay. The planning board also has the option of requiring less parking and giving more height if that's what's needed to get this more green, get more green infrastructure. Okay. I threw this in. According to a recent quadrangle uh, marketing brochure that I picked up, uh, Cambridge is, quote, the hottest market in the country, bar none, and has insatiable tenant demand. Our petition doesn't change the fact people want to live and work in Cambridge. Don't worry. Okay. Will this increase costs? Well, all taxpayers benefit when the city better prepares for future problems. Okay. Just like I mentioned, building codes, have a, there's a reason for that, and it's because you're exchanging costs up front with future value. It's an insurance policy. Okay. We do know that green systems in general tend to be cheaper than gray systems. They're cheaper to build and they're cheaper to maintain over the long term. Okay. Reduced parking actually makes it cheaper per square foot to build livable space. Okay. Parking spaces cost about $45,000 to build, depending on if you're going to put them in a building or underground. Okay. The environmental costs, as I mentioned, aren't, aren't increased, they're shifted. They're earlier in the process. And the truth is, once you build the building, it's a little bit harder and more complicated and more expensive to retrofit it than it is to add that extra foot at the beginning. Okay, in some cases, it's impossible. Last thing, FEMA says that if you spend a dollar up front on flood mitigation, you save six bucks in damages down the road. Okay, that's a good number to remember. Last thing, as I said, just because you don't live in a flood zone, uh, doesn't mean you don't benefit when the city is more resilient, okay? City resilience is the effort to benefit all of us, okay? Big question, what about housing? Well, first off, we mentioned small houses are excluded. That's the current language in the, in the ordinance, okay? But if you're gonna build housing, and we are building housing, if you remember the numbers back there, I don't know if I showed it, but we are, um, new housing has to be safe and it has to be healthy. Okay. Permanent housing for permanent residents, they need to be safe and healthy for as long as they're here, into the future. Okay. They should not be unsafe or unhealthy to their neighbors in the future either. Okay. As the heat and the flooding increases, the new housing being built should continue to be desirable. Okay. Affordable unit, when you're a tenant in an affordable unit, you're placed by the city. If you're placed in a floodplain, and as I mentioned, the vast majority of construction is in the floodplain right now, those units should be safe and resilient too. Okay, they deserve it just as much as anybody. Okay, and I will note that last winter, 51 units in Jefferson Park had to be abandoned because they were not safe. They had mold problems, they were basement units, they were wet, okay. We don't wanna build a lot of new housing to solve our problem and find out that 50 years from now, it's not doing the job. And at last, uh, natural solutions, as I said, they're more resilient, and they also tend to be cheaper. So why is all this important? Well, people expect Cambridge to protect its residents, right, to keep them safe, out of harm's way. Okay, so we want safe places to live. We wanna protect our economy and the jobs that are here, okay? Moody's will tell you that from now on, they are going to assess your climate change um, vulnerability when they rate your bonds. We need to protect all that infrastructure because what you see is a tall building doesn't work if it doesn't have power. Okay, you can't pump water up a hill without power. Okay, so we need a grid that's resilient. We need <coughs> infrastructure in the transportation space that's resilient. Well, in, in part, we have the electrical substation that's in the flood zone the LRT station and the roadways out are all flooded too. So if you need to evacuate Route 2, it's inaccessible because it's Route 16. Right. 
I mean, we are talking about smart growth, and, and smart growth is not just about the location and the density, but also the future, I would tell you. It, if someone says, well, this is great stuff now, but tomorrow it's gonna be a problem, I, didn't think that's, I don't think that's smart. Okay. And as we mentioned before, there's a return. So with, the, with green investments, green infrastructure, it's about three to one when you look at the flood and the cooling uh, uh, payoff down the road. That's also an economic benefit from having that right. place. So climate change is happening, and how we respond as a community determines how we cope and care for each other. And if we act now, we avoid some of those impacts. How do you change the status quo? Well, we need to require what should be done, not just ask, and so that everyone benefits in the future. Okay? Get actively involved, do your homework, and show up and speak. Okay? Here's your chance next week. Two meetings. Short, not short. Um, you only get three minutes, but come. And that's it.